Canto 28 of The Purgatory is very mysterious. At one level, it's prompted one of these endless debates about the Divine Comedy. Who is the woman that they're about to meet? Was she historical? Is she purely allegorical? Is she mythological? Is she seasonal? We don't know, and certainly in this canto, that doesn't matter, because I think the whole purpose of it is to dwell in this extraordinary new place that Dante, Virgil and Statius have now entered, referred to as the earthly Eden. And the opening tercets of the canto do capture a lot of the amazement with really this new state of being that they're fully embarked upon now, having been through the wall of fire, having come through all the different elements of purgatory. And Dante describes it as a forest. Um, of course, that reminds us of the forest that he was lost in all that way back at the beginning of the Inferno. Only now, this time, it feels full of life, it feels full of purpose, it feels full of joy. This forest knows exactly what it's about. It's said that the winds blow in a constant direction um, in relation to the east, the sunrise. It's said that the waters flow not because they're part of some natural cycle, but because they're flowing with the eternal life that comes from God and God's self. We're told right early on that the flowers and the trees, the plants, the birds even singing in the boughs of the trees that are also singing with the wind, they're not living by a natural life. They're not caught up in the earthly cycles. They're living a life that's actually truer and fuller than the reflection of the life that we most immediately feel around us now. Their life is an echo, a reflection of divine life. And no wonder that feels strange. No wonder that feels kind of incomprehensible and as much daunting as it does appealing. Um, again, I think that this canto very deliberately leaves us in a kind of suspense so that we can at least get a vague taste of the extraordinary state that Dante now finds himself in. You know, in a way he has been reborn through that fire, through his journey, but to be reborn is itself quite a troubling experience. And in his amazement, you might say he's actually transforming, he's being propelled into a new world with hardly noticing that dynamic going on. He's just kind of struck and trying to make sense of things, even as, spiritually speaking, he is pro being propelled quite fast now into a whole new dimension of existence. And although it is gorgeous, and although his will and love are now aligned, so ultimately they can only lead him back to God, it doesn't mean that this place is not going to be ominous, even frightening, and that he is not going to be troubled. His transformation is, in a way, only picking up speed now. And whilst he, I think, knows at some level of his being that he's never going to fall into the non-states of being which he'd experienced in the depths of hell, he can only be led towards being in all its fullness. That's not to say that it's not profoundly unsettling. And there's an intimation of this because as they walk into this enchanted forest. So far now, Dante says that they can't actually see the point where they entered it. They come across a stream and at once they immediately see that its waters are more sparkling and pure and delightful than any waters seen on earth. But at the same time, they can't see into the waters. They're dark as well. And that mix of light and impenetrability, not able to see into, is going to be quite a feature of what unfolds now. Then, 
Dante becomes almost aware before he sees of something even more marvellous on the other side of the stream. And he says a solitary lady was there. She's gathering flowers. She's singing a song of sweet words that at this point he can't quite hear. And she, you might say, is fully radiant and transparent and at one with the gorgeousness of this place. The vitality which he sees in human form and in her beauty is very much a kind of focus of the vitality and the beauty of the place. She shines with the love that's the love of God, Dante says. And, not surprisingly, he's deeply drawn towards it. But there's this stream here with its slightly unsettling impenetrability. And so he asks her to come towards him. Now, she's not named yet. Um, we don't know who she is. The commentators actually, as I say, never quite settle on who she is. And just what's going on for Dante by calling her towards him, too, is much debated. And part of the reason for that is that um, it seems to echo a medieval trope of the, the individual man walking into the forest and meeting a beautiful lady who then is able to satisfy his desire with all the erotic overtones of that. But also Dante, the pilgrim, um, alludes to three mythological encounters that seem to at once stress a kind of innocence, but not forgetting a kind of shadow as well. So for example, right now, as he sees her, um, he says to her, you remind me of Persephone before she was taken into the underworld, when she was still caught up in the eternal spring. Um, you remember that the myth of Persephone explains in a way the seasons as what was eternal spring being dragged into the underworld, so it has to be reborn with her return to um, the world of light when she's um, brought back um, by her mother Demeter, although she's eaten some of the pomegranate seed and so has to return to the underworld each year, hence the cycle of the earthly seasons. So Dante's reference to her now captures that you might call mythological fall in this earthly Eden. But nonetheless, his stress is on the eternal spring before the fall, as if that's what he's really seeing here now. When he turns to her, he says that her eyes were alight with the love of Venus, after Venus had been accidentally scratched by the arrows of her son uh, Cupid, causing her to fall in love with Adonis. So there's a kind of innocent fall captured in that allusion too, because Venus's eyes are ablaze with love, um, but she's slightly trapped by it too, because they're now for the love of Adonis rather than just the pure love um, that shines like the morning star heralding the dawn. So a strange mix that he sees in this woman's eyes of original love, but perhaps in his mind, caught up with the sense that is this going to fall? Can this be really pure? Um, beginning to get some sense of where he's at, that he knows that he's in a different mindset now. He knows that he's experiencing a different life that is free of the earthly complications that he's known thus far. But these earthly combinations, the fall, the desire to possess even, this mix of eroticism which he's been so wrestling with up Mount Purgatory, it's still in his mind and it comes to his mind when he sees this mysterious woman. The third illusion, um, if we've had the one to Persephone, we've had the one to Venus, is the one to the mythological character of Leander who you might remember falls in love with Hero and she's in a tower and he must swim across the Hellespont each night in order to be joined with her. She lights a flame so that he can find his way until one night she doesn't and Leander gets lost in the waters, drowns. Hero later finds his body and throws herself in the waters too. So there's a kind of, again, a mix of um, beautiful young love untainted love, 
um, that will, as it were, give itself in pursuit of that joy. But it comes unstuck in the mythological story as well. So these, this mix of feeling is in Dante's mind as he sees this beautiful woman, calls her towards him, wants to hear about the sweetness of her words, wants to come closer to her love, to her vitality, to the shine that she gives forth. But there's also this stream in between them. And he says, if only it would part so that I could cross. An allusion clearly to the Red Sea parting when the people of Hebrew, people of Israel came out of the slavery into the new promised land. He can see the promised land, if you like. He can feel it. He wants it. And yet he's not quite at the point of being able to enter it. That's partly what this scene is setting up as well. The deep truth that although your love and will can be aligned with the divine love and will, there's still a whole lot more that's got to happen if you're going to become truly capable and transformed so as to be able to participate unalloyed in it. And that is the excitement and the intrigue, um, the interest and the sense that Dante is communicating to us of what must happen to us at this new stage of the divine journey. She now sees that the three of them, Dante who's been speaking and is very much to the four in the feel of the canto, but nonetheless Virgil and Statius are there too. She sees that they're both amazed and delighted, but also bemused and wondering what this is all about. And so she offers to explain things to them. She refers at first to the line from a psalm that talks of the psalm singer delighting in the works of the Lord. And that's clearly what she's doing. There's also in our mind, because of Dante's last dream, the figures of Leah and Rachel, who, as you remember in the dream, were gathering flowers, one to adorn themselves, one just to delight in the works of the Lord in themselves. And so this figure seems to capture elements of both Leah and Rachel. Um, Again, just in parenthesis, the commentators go into quite a lot of depth at this point about maybe this figure is the active love um, being personified before Dante. Um, we await the contemplative love. Um, but I think it's a bit too clunky, a bit too formulaic to kind of tear these things apart. And remember that um, dreams lift us to a more tropological level. Um, they maybe give us alternatives, but the idea is that the, the, um, the attempt to put those alternatives together, if you like, in the imagery propels us to a new insight. Um, and so my sense would be that Dante's dream is helping him see this figure who's now appeared before him in his waking consciousness. Um, she is something of the active and the contemplative, the doing and the being, love that's, that's, that's woven together in a beautiful image that he now sees. He wants to ask her questions because he's been told by Statius, if you remember, um, that um, the features of this now high place on Mount Purgatory are different from um, the features of Earth below, um, particularly the features around the wind and the rain and the, the water and, and the earthquake um, which they'd felt, you know, what causes them. Um, they're a very different experience from what happens in our normal mundane lives, although they can ostensibly see the same. And she does indeed say that what they're seeing now um, is actually the Aboriginal, it's the pre-fallen um, experience of the created world. Um, she explains that, for example, the wind moves because it's a spirit wind. Um, remember that the word pneuma in Greek and ruach in Hebrew originally did mean wind and spirit, as if the word itself captures this memory. And the wind here moves because it is a spirit that captures the divine momentum, the love that we're going to increasingly discover gives motion to all things. That's why it's moving. It's not moving because like the wind on earth, it's caught up in sort of random fluctuations and disturbances. Um, uh, it's not being propelled because it's kind of trapped in lower regions, much like 
you know, so much of the earth is as they've been experiencing as they journeyed through the inferno and Mount Purgatory. Similarly, with the water flowing, it's not part of a natural cycle, uh, you know, where waters rise with heat of the sun and then fall back to earth. Um, sort of lovely that that can be, but a sort of perpetual um, closed cycle, you might say. You know, these waters are part of the waters of the everlasting flow that comes from God, um, an open, ever replenishing um, dynamic. Um, and that's what they're seeing now in this strange stream in front of them. She also explains that um, the flowers and the trees that are growing here aren't seeded like flowers and trees are on earth. Um, they self-perpetuate and they spring up from their own vitality. And so, too, there's a kind of supernatural element to this forest. Um, supernatural meaning it's caught up in the source of nature. Um, it's kind of over nature, if you like. Um, the nature that we know is but a, a, a sort of reflection of that. And so they're seeing, they're seeing what Owen Barfield, the chap who I'm so influenced by, um, I mentioned right at the beginning of uh, this discussion of the cantos, um, he uh, became convinced um, that consciousness evolves and in particular he traced this evolution through the pre-Christian into the Christian period as one of a shift of participation, whereas in the early Hebrew Bible, the early Greek texts like those of Homer, the mythological period, um, people experience life as being in a flow of meaning. Um, the challenge wasn't to ask where is the meaning of life, the challenge was how to navigate the meaning which flowed and flooded all around. Um, he called it original participation. And I'm very much reminded of this by this description now because of the, the spirit wind, the eternal water, um, and this figure before them now is very much sharing in that, is participating in that. And in fact, at the end of the canto, she's going to say quite explicitly, particularly to Status and Virgil, that she is living in the golden age that the ancient poets tried to remember, and which I think is remembered um, as an actual state of being um, when human consciousness was really very, very different. Um, because there wasn't this question of, are there gods? Is there meaning? Um, it was much more, how do we relate to the gods that we see? How do we find a way through the meaning of life that's so evident to us? Um, if you like, it's what happened, what was lost with what is remembered in the Christian story as the fall, a sense of alienation and separation. Um, but she also alludes to this alienation and separation itself having meaning. It's not just a disaster, because she also explains to Dante that here on Earth, echoes of that original participation can still be felt. Um, she says some of the seeds blow from this high place and fall on Earth, producing flowers and trees that no one recognises and is amazed by. Um, and I like to think that Although we have scientific explanations for the evolution and the origin of species now, um, due to genetic mutation and natural selection and so on, the experience of discovering new species is much better caught by this story that life sort of overspills from the heavenly realms um, and fills up the earth beneath. Um, because, you know, you only have to watch a natural history program on the television um, to see the scientists wander when they discover a new species of spider or flower, when they descend into the ocean's depths and see bizarre and extraordinary creatures, you know, lit up by phosphorescence, looking like aliens on Earth. The experience is a wonder. How can these things possibly have emerged, even though we sort of have a theory in the theory of evolution, which, insofar as it goes, is no doubt true. I don't doubt it. But we're being asked to experience life on a different level, I think, with what Dante is talking about now. And actually, it's quite easy to experience life, even here on Earth, even in this sort of fallen and separated, alienated state that shapes so much of life. These moments of wonder, these glimpses of amazement, 
that we get on earth when we see something new and think how can that possibly have come about this life even though we're kind of taught in the classroom how it's come about that's the wonder that they're experiencing now full on because they've returned to the source of life um, that's actually beyond just the causal mechanisms it's the very vitality it's the fire that's in the equations um, to recall Einstein's phrase that they're experiencing now she also gives names to the stream that's in front of them and she says another stream that they're going to see as well the one in front of them is called Lethe and then there's going to be the stream of Unoe as well now Lethe is um, the stream of oblivion known in ancient mythology it's a stream of forgetting and then Unoe is a Dante coinage something he saw I guess when he was there um, it means um, good mind and the woman explains to them they have to drink both of these streams they have to drink from them in order to and the sweetness that this drinking will give them will be quite overwhelming and tremendous and wonderful um, we don't quite know what that's about yet we're going to find out um, which is pausing with what can it be that there's a kind of forgetting um, but then a kind of remembering um, in the you know a stream the good minded stream um, well I think it's what it's going to be about is being able to return to this original participation but without forgetting all that has happened in the alienated period um, Barfield called this a reciprocal participation this newly restored spiritual life and the point about it is that nothing goes to waste in the divine dispensation you know the alienation the fall wasn't just some sort of terrible mistake it was a tragedy that leads to the new comedy the new life because what in particular it allows us to do is to know ourselves as individuals often because of our struggle and what went wrong and the difficulty the sense of alienation but that gives form if you like it gives kind of psychological reality to our individuality and the wonderful thing about this initiation that Dante is now going on this next stage of his journey um, particularly symbolized through the drinking of these different waters is that all that he is is going to be gathered up into the person that becomes capable of moving into the heavenly realms he must sort of forget in the sense that he must loosen himself from the ties that would other hold him back um, and hold him in the alienated state um, but he must also remember because it's that very development of himself as an individual that is going to be brought into the experience going forward into paradise and enabling him to have it with even more wonder in a way but also more consciousness more glory more splendor um, that is a little intimation here um, of the tremendousness of the comedy that comes out even of the tragedy um, that the inferno and the purgatory have so fully dwelt upon she then says to Virgil and Status particularly about how um, what they're experiencing now is perhaps what the ancient poets were half remembering in their accounts of the golden age and Virgil and Status are both delighted by that illusion you know it connects something for them they're part of that tradition which knew it was onto something um, with an older original experience of meaning and divine um, human sharing um, what in the Christian and Jewish tradition is um, remembered in the Eden stories um, so they're really delighted about that it it brings something together for them they're able to participate in this moment that bit more fully as well and then the canto ends with Dante once more turning towards this beautiful image that's appeared before him um, he loves it as much as she radiates love towards him and maybe just one final thought you know if they've entered this place which is both delightful but also ominous it's very significant I think that Dante has used his erotic desire even though it still carries the shadows 
um, even of abduction, um, like in the case of Persephone being taken into the underworld, he's been able to use um, the desire for light and love in his erotic desire to ask this apparition to come towards him that he may know more fully about the sweetness of her words and there's quite a profound spiritual truth in that that when we find ourselves in these slightly different states of mind when we feel we're encountering something that's not just of the mundane and humdrum world um, but might be of a fuller life a fuller world you know whether it be an imagining whether it be a full-on encounter with some kind of spirit to remember to use whatever we have to positively move towards that encounter. It will positively come towards us and can be part of the expansion of life and vitality, even as here in the Divine Comedy, it seems that Dante is now embarking on to 